Okay, welcome to the lesson about creating scatter plots and just diving a little deeper into this. You should have just watched the um, crash course video that was posted on our Moodle page for this lesson. If you haven't done that, stop this recording, watch the video. The link is right above the link to this worksheet. Um, watch that video, then come back and finish watching this recording and do this exercise with me. Um, okay, once you have watched that, now um, open up your scatter plots worksheet if you haven't already, and it should look like this. And we're just going to talk about how to create these scatter plots and just looking at correlation between different variables. So just to rehash what Adrian talked about in the video, um, what is a scatter plot? A scatter plot gives us the relationship between two data sets and helps us determine if they are correlated. Is there some sort of relationship between these two variables? Um, we look at um, on the graph x and y. x is the horizontal axis and y is the vertical axis. x on the horizontal axis, which goes left and right, um, is typically the independent variable, meaning it is what it is. It, it usually isn't affected by the other thing. Um, y represented on the vertical axis, up and down, is the dependent variable. Y usually will change because of X if there's a correlation. So what do these relationships look like? Well, we have some examples over here. Um, I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger. Oops, not that big. Hmm. Here we go. We can have a positive linear association between the variables, meaning that x and y increase together. As x increases in value along the horizontal axis, y also increases in value along the vertical axis. They increase together, and we see this positive linear relationship. An inverse or negative linear relationship means that as x increases, y decreases. So as we move along the x-axis, x increases, but y has started high and decreases in value along the vertical axis. So we've got a direct relationship with a positive linear association an inverse relationship with a negative linear association. We can also see by creating a scatter plot if there's no relationship at all. Uh, you can see over here there's no association. Um, one doesn't really affect the other. We can't find any uh, rhyme or reason to why x is what it is versus why y is what it is. There can also be um, nonlinear associations where they are correlated, but it's not direct or inverse, where as one increases, the other increases, or as x increases, y decreases. We can have, you know, x increase for a time while y decreases. And then something happens in here, and x is still increasing, but y is also increasing. So it goes negative to positive. Uh, and there can be um, all sorts of different nonlinear associations. We're not going to get into those in our class. We're going to focus on linear associations, positive and negative. So we talked about the coefficient of correlation, r, the r value. This indicates both the direction and strength of the linear relationship between y and x. r is always between positive 1 and negative 1. 
as we get close to positive 1, this indicates a strong positive linear relationship. Both increase together. So in this example that we're showing, R might have a value of 0.8. They're a little spread out, um, but we're approaching 1 because we definitely have a positive linear association. Um, but if R is 1, that means they're basically all along the uh, one line. This would pretty much just look like a line. As we get to negative 1, that indicates a strong negative linear relationship. X increases and Y decreases. So we have here a strong negative linear relationship. So R might be around negative 0.8 uh, in this case. That's a, just a guess um, based on what we're seeing here. <clears throat> if R is close to zero, this indicates no relationship. And so this would our data set would look more like this no association graph. So R, R the coefficient of correlation, um, just helps us understand the strength of the linear relationship or if there is no linear relationship. R squared, or the coefficient of determination, this value is the proportion of the variation in y that is explained by the best fit linear equation. Can I use x to predict y? And how, um, how strong is that prediction? How well can x predict y? Um, R squared is going to be between 0 and 1. The 0 end it means that variation cannot be explained by the equation. And 1, the yeah, closer you get to 1, means that there is a stronger predictive value um, in the equation. And x, when you calculate y based on x, you can rely on that solution more. We call it the line of best fit, and that's y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope and b is the y-intercept, where uh, the data points cross at the y-axis. So can we use the best fit linear equation to predict y if we know x? The closer r squared is to 1, the better the equation can predict y. So that's just a rehash of the video. Um, nice to have it written out. So let's do some examples where we're creating a few scatter plots and even predicting y based on x. Um, in our example here, we have six local offices of a large tax preparation firm. The following data describes service revenue, which is going to be x, and expenses for supplies, freight, and postage, which will be y, during the previous tax prep season. In this case, we have service revenue and want to see if there is a relationship between service revenue and supplies, freight, and postage. It's very simple to create a scatter plot. Uh, once we have collected our data and just lined it up together, these are the points that we're going to plot together. On the x-axis, we're going to plot service revenue, and here's each point, and with each service revenue data point, we're going to plot its corresponding uh, supplies freight postage value. So for this com for this office, they had 351,400 uh, dollars of service revenue, and that corresponds to 18,400 dollars of supplies freight and postage expense. So let's go ahead and highlight our data, including the labels. And I've got uh, directions written out here. We just come up to insert, and we find the scatter plot, which um, is right here, little dots all around. And it says scatter, and we can just pick that first one, create a scatter plot. Um, 
and we'll just put it in this gray area here. So we've got our plot points. Um, this graph looks pretty good. I'm, I'm pretty fine with our boundaries. Um, if we want, we could decrease the Y um, um, vertical axis boundaries. Um, so instead of starting at zero, we could start at 10 and that will just change how our, our line shows up and we can see that data a little bit better. Um, if we want, we can um, do the same with our horizontal axis. I just double clicked on that. And we can change our minimum boundary to 200. And we can see how, <clears throat> how our data points are spread out. So if I look here, I've got a data point. If I hover over that, I've got 200. 38,000 on the x-axis, 238.1, and that corresponds to 16 um, of postage. And I can see that data point right over here, 238.1 and 16. So we've created our scatter plot. We want to insert the line of best fit. The line of best fit tries to hit as many data points as possible and be as close to all of the data as possible. And so there's a calculation that goes into that. And once again, we're lucky because Excel is going to do it for us. So we just select our chart, make sure it's selected so that our chart design option pops up. And we can come over to Add Chart Element. And we can go ahead and add that trend line. And we're looking at a linear line, so we want to add our linear trend line. So this line pops in where it is the closest to every data point that it can get. I also want Excel to um, give me the line of best fit equation, and Excel can do that for me, and that way I can um, start to predict Y based on X. But off the top of my head, I don't know what this slope is. I'm not 100% sure what the Y intercept is. It's around 14, right? Uh, so once again, make sure your chart is selected, and then come back to add chart element, back to trend line, more trend line options. And all the way down at the bottom here, we can choose display equation on chart. And we want to display that R squared value on the chart so that we can see what that is. Once we do that, we can close this. And it pops in, but it's kind of hard to see where it is. So we'll move it down here. I was going to try to make it a little bigger, but apparently I cannot. Okay, so we get our line of best fit, y equals, and I wrote it over here, y equals 0.0344x plus 7.152. So if we know that, so now we can use this line of best fit to predict um, if we know sales revenue, we can predict what supplies, freight, and postage costs will be. So we just plug that in. If we know that service revenue is going to be 450000 or we're predicting that service revenue is going to be 450000 for 
um, maybe a new office that we're opening up, we also want to be able to budget for what the supplies, freight, and postage expenses will be. So we can predict that based on that service revenue. Now we can use this equation. The 450,000 sales revenue is X, so we'll plug that in for X. And then we'll use our slope and intercept to get Y. And so we can just say point zero three four four times four fifty plus seven point one five two. We get twenty two point six three two, and this is in thousands. So we predict supplies, freight, and postage expense to be around 22,632,000. So this is how we can um, budget for uh, that expense based on our predicted uh, service revenue. So that's our first example. Let's do another example. This is wood density versus solution uptake. So by now you've finished the uh, first test and we had those assay scores. Um, and you know we looked at the statistics uh, we talked about the procedure of uh, saturation um, and we were testing charges, testing samples to understand the total overall saturation and the average saturation for all of our um, production of wood products. So now we can look, so one of our theories when we did the first test was that wood density has an effect on saturation and that when we have denser wood or knots in the wood or whatever the um, liquid liquid will have a harder time penetrating completely through the wood and now we can look at the relationship between wood density and solution uptake. Uh, this is not from UFP, this is just something else that I found on the internet, but it fits with our last test, so it's an interesting um, uh, thing to do. So these aren't exactly related to our assay project, um, but um, a good idea to look at. So we've measured wood density and we've measured solution uptake and we can determine if they're related. So in our first case, our wood density measured uh, 561 kilograms per meter cubed and our solution uptake was 700. So now we can go ahead and highlight all our data. Come to insert, find that scatter plot, and we've got kind of a funky looking plot here. So let's go ahead and adjust our boundaries so that we can spread this out a little more. Let's definitely adjust our horizontal axis. Double click, and instead of starting at zero, I'm going to start at 500. And maybe I'll even start at 540. And that lets me see that relationship a little bit better. So now that we've plotted the data, we want to insert that trend line and line of best fit. Uh, so I just uh, click on the chart, 
come up to chart design, add chart element, come down to trend line, and give me a linear trend line. And Excel automatically updated our boundaries a little bit just so they could get that line in there. Um, now we want to add that line of best fit and our R squared trend line, more trend line options. And on the side here, down at the bottom, display equation on chart and display R squared value on chart. And let's move that up here so we can see it a little better. It's very small. And we get our line of best fit. Looking at this chart, I can see that we have a negative linear relationship versus the chart above where we had a positive linear relationship. Above, as sales revenue increased, supplies, freight, and postage expense increased, which makes sense. The more we sell, the more we likely have to ship out and we have to pay to ship that out. So that makes sense, a positive linear relationship. On our wood density values, we have a negative linear relationship. The higher the wood density, so the more dense the wood, the lower the solution uptake. And we can see that very clearly. Um, less solution is absorbed in higher density wood. So if you look at this really teeny tiny number here, it's y equals negative 0.71x plus 1084.1. That's our um, line of best fit. And r squared is 0 0.7035 versus above, we had an r squared 0.9248. What that r squared is telling us when we compare these two is that sales revenue is a very, very good predictor of supplies, freight, and postage expense. We can use this equation, we can plug in x, and we get a very accurate prediction for y. When we look at our solution uptake, we've got an r squared of 0.7035. That's still pretty good. X is a very good predictor of Y, so that if we want to predict the solution uptake at a certain wood density level, um, we can use this equation to make that prediction and feel pretty good about it. Um, it's going to make sense. So if we want to do that, we can um, we can extrapolate here. Our highest data point was I don't know why it's not giving me the number, but let's say we want to uh, predict if we have a wood density of 700, what will be our solution uptake? So we can just plug 700 into that formula equals negative 0.71 times 700 plus 1084.1 and we should end up with a solution uptake of 587.1 which would put our data point right about here at the 700 and just up just a little bit. And that makes sense and it'll be right along this line. And of course just more um, re 
reaffirming to you that correlation does not necessarily equal causation. There is causation in the world for correlated variables. Some things definitely do cause other things to happen. But just because two things are correlated does not absolutely mean that one causes the other. So if the data suggests two variables are strongly correlated, does it show that one causes the other? Not necessarily. The variables may correlate by chance or be influenced by additional factors not indicated in our plot. To understand causation, it's important to understand the study, how the data was collected, and if the researchers followed sound experimental design. That's very important. It's easier to show correlation, much harder to prove causation. And just as was outlined in the video, with the Nicolas Cage movies versus the air conditioning versus drownings. Um, you know, buying air conditioners or having air conditioning is not what causes drowning, drowning, but drownings typically go hand in hand with air conditioner usage because both happen during the summer months much more frequently. More people swim in the summer and use air conditioning in the summer. And I would say that, you know, Nicolas Cage, because he has made uh, more summer block blockbuster type movies, his movies are released more often in the summer than in the winter. So, you know, um, even though we see a correlation there between Nick Cage movie releases and drownings, it doesn't mean that those movie releases cause the drowning. So it's just very, very important to understand where our data came from, how it was collected, what is it saying about our data, um, and what are the researchers trying to infer? Does it make sense? Does it make sense that one thing causes the other? Uh, if it doesn't make sense, it's probably because one thing doesn't cause the other. Um, but like I say, there is cause in the world. We just can't prove it through these scatter plots. We have to um, do additional research. So now that we've created a couple scatter plots, your homework is on this homework tab. And we're looking at a table of data from the 2006 census. And you're going to use different data sets to create scatter plots and interpret your findings. You'll create two scatter plots. Here's a place for one, here's a place for two. And then just write a very short interpretation down below. You can select two different columns that are non-adjacent. If you want to select adjacent columns for your scatter plot, you can just do this and select these two items, two columns, and create your scatter plot, and that's fine. If you want non-adjacent columns, you would first select, I won't go all the way down, first select this data, and then hold uh, Control, click the top of the next column, shift, and click the, I don't know what happened here. I've got one column. Control, click, I don't know, I don't know what's happening. Oh, it's because I'm using a Mac. On your Windows, this should work. My Mac has different keyboard shortcuts that I can't figure out right now. But you will select 
press your control button, click the next column that you want, hold shift, click the bottom of the column, and that should highlight everything in between. Mine's just being a pain. That should get you two non-adjacent columns, and then you would just go ahead and insert your scatter plot. Put your scatter plot down here. Insert the linear trend line, display the equation, display R squared, and then interpret that. Is the data positively or negatively related or not at all correlated? Um, if there's correlation between the data, do you think one is a cause of the other? Why or why not? Again, very brief description, just a couple sentences. Um, but we've got the states. We've got their area in square miles, their total population, their population density per square mile, their mean elevation, average elevation, median age, per capita income, and the highest temperature recorded in Fahrenheit. Once you have completed those two, save this upload it to our Moodle page for points. And let me know um, if you have any questions. I will see you soon.